Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our webinar today. I'm Melissa Adriano, the Marketing Assistant of Syndata, and I have with me Phil Story, the CEO of Syndata, as well as Luis Estrada, the Global Business Development Executive of Film Partners. Today's topic will be about the integration between MXF server software and our Zendata archive systems. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation, so please feel free to type in any questions you may have in the questions box, which should be in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Also, this session will be recorded and we'll be happy to share it with you later on once it becomes available on our website and YouTube channel. So at this point, I'll hand it over to Luis. Thank you very much, Alisa. Well, uh, since this is a worldwide webinar, I guess we need to start with uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you up there. I am very happy to be with you today. What prompted this webinar is a recent completion of an integration, API integration between MXF Server and Sendata. Although these two products have been working together for a long time, be a more basic integration. The use of the Sendata workflow uh, API has allowed for a much more elegant and powerful solution. Let's start with collaborative post-production. A lot of people associate collaborative post-production with having a, a big storage environment where everybody works from. And that actually is a great start. That's where things start. Without a central repository of materials, the workflow becomes extremely difficult because you need to move media from one place to the next and everything is serial and there is very little opportunity for collaboration other than serial collaboration. So once you get your storage and you are now able to connect all of those users to that storage, uh, there are other challenges. Uh, that, again, that's just the beginning of so the solution. The first of them is the project and content organization. Well, even in your computer or in your laptop, if you are accumulating files, it reaches the point that it becomes more difficult to find things. Even if you are the most, the best organized and disciplined person in the world, it is really very possible and very likely that you're going to start having issues finding stuff. And then when you have two, three, five, ten users sharing the same collaborative environment, the same storage, all of you with a different idea of what organization really means and what discipline is, it is very likely that you're going to end up with the wild, wild west. It's going to be very difficult to find things once you have a large group of people doing that. So the the institution of a project and content organization that is accepted and, and used by everybody is very important in that environment. Okay, from there we move to the laws of IT. There is something called referential integrity. If you don't have referential integrity, what it really means is if you are trying to access a file from two different locations, if two different users are trying to use the same file at the same time, it is very likely that you're going to end up corrupting that file and it's not going to be useful anymore. Also, you have to think about access control. Uh, essentially, who is accessing the materials? Only those users that should be allowed to access the materials should be accessing the materials. So security is another item that you need to be concerned about. Then, more and more, post-production is not just the job of a single tool. You need multiple tools to do the job. You may have, obviously, the video editing systems, but you also have graphic systems, you have audio editing systems, and you have imaging systems and all kinds of other applications that are really used in the modern post-production workflow. So your platform needs to be able to support all of those tools in a more or less standard way. If you have to have a separate uh, infrastructure for every tool, that not only is very expensive, but you also you go back to the very inefficient and serial way in which uh, uh, analog production used to be done in the past. So multi-tool focus and support is very critical. Then, even if you have a huge storage environment, as you work with projects, you're going to get the need of offloading some of them and archiving them. This is where send data comes to be. This is what send data resolves. You need to be able to offload that media in such a way that you 
preserve the production storage for new projects and work that is being done. Once the project is completed and you need to move it to an archive, it needs to be done in a very easy way. Uh, if it's too complicated, it tends not to be done and then you end up with a full storage, regardless of how big your storage is. Then you have the is issue of future proof in your platform. Well, at some point in time, after three, four, five years, your current storage will have to be replaced with something new. And perhaps uh, one of your tool sets just became obsolete, let's say uh, Final Cut Pro 7, and you need to replace that tool with something else. Well, ideally, the platform that you have chosen is something that will allow you to migrate to a different tool without really uh, impacting your workflow or the workflow structures that you have in place. Then, more and more, you have the issue of workload location flexibility. What that means is you may have users of the system that are not co-located where the system is. They may be remote. But even though there are remote users, they should have the ability to be able to do the things that they would do if they were in the same place. So all of these issues and challenges are things that MXF Server was created to resolve. We address them in a very elegant way. So and that moves us to the question of what is MXF Server? So before answering the question, I also need to go into a little bit of history. Where does it come from? Where the concept of collaboration with the server environment comes from? Actually, the credit is due to a company called Avid. Avid came up with the first modern way of doing post-production with computers. And it is a very elegant and very neat way of doing work. You have a storage environment. It used to be called uh, Unity. Now it's, it's called ISIS. And in that collaborative environment, you have spaces, workspaces, that basically are the containers where your media and your projects exist. Now, in order to work with these shared items, the editors are essentially as accessing the materials from individual workstations where the application resides. Now, in the typical video post-production workflow, you are not actually modifying the source materials. You're accessing those materials and creating some recipes of treatments that establish the sequence of the materials, the transition, the effects, anything, and any other effect that you want to incorporate into that uh, new video uh, that you're producing. So those objects are also included in the workspaces. And in order for this to happen, there is a single index that is used to access the materials inside. Now, this is great, and it works to a great degree with no issues, but you have the issue of potentially having accidental deletions of materials or corruption, because you're actually accessing the original materials in real time. You are potentially sharing those materials with two users at the same time. The other thing is, for this environment to work, Avid basically grants administrative capabilities to every one of the users, so that increases the risk of corruption or accidental deletion. So this is the, this is the current, uh, or this was the state of the art until a couple of years ago, <laughs> actually a few more years than that, but we have now in MXS Server a different concept, and this different concept has to do with project-based editing. Project-based editing basically has the same containers where the media goes and the projects go, but the original materials are never touched by the editors. There is this other layer, a virtual layer, that creates a container that is essentially a mirror image of the original materials, but every user has its own virtualization. Now, what happens is, by means of the user interface that is supported by the MXF server, the users select a project. Well, before they do that, they have to log on. By, by doing the log on, they establish what kind of access they have to the system and the kind of functions that they can perform. And the workflow status is also reflected in that user interface. So when the user uses that user interface to connect to a project, internally, the MSF server creates a linkage between the original master materials and the structures that the user see. Now, with this kind of approach, you may have any number of users 
essentially using the same materials, but all of them will actually be using a separate sandbox. And in that sandbox, they are the king. They can erase materials, they can do whatever they want to, but in reality, they are not really affecting the original master. So if somebody accidentally deleted a file, all they are doing is deleting that index entry that is pointing to the original materials. So the other users are not affected because each one has its own link to the to original materials. So in this kind of, of way, we are really securing ourselves against corruption and accidental deletion of things. Also increases the level of parallel work that can happen at the same time. Any number of users can work with the original materials this way because you don't have any contention. Every user is accessing the original materials via its own path. So that path is unique to every user. By the same token, if you want to send something, let's say offload, you want to offload materials to an LTO cartridge or an ODA cartridge or to the cloud, by the push of a single button in the MXF server interface, you essentially can issue a backup project or archive project command and automatically the MXS server, by means of the interface with send data, will send that material automatically out, releasing the space that you need to work on other projects. Okay, so this is very, very elegant and very simple to do. You'll need to be looking at the materials, determining what needs to be archived. All of that is automatically determined by the way that you are organizing your projects. And basically you have a say on how you organize the projects because everything is configurable. Let's look at the architecture. How does it work? So we have essentially four entities within the MXF server architecture. Uh, we have, in the center, we have a storage environment. And MXF server works for a variety of different storage environments. Uh, you can have a SAN, you can have a NAS, you can have uh, systems like Isilon, you can have a media grid. And even now we have an alternative with a send data system that Phil is going to be talking to you about. I don't want to steal the thunder, but essentially any certified storage system can be in the middle. Then you have the users working on workstations with all their tool sets that they use to do their normal work. Another computer in the same network is the MXF server. And the MXF server has the functionality to support all of the functions that are in the user interface. Then in the same network, you have a send data server, and the send data server is the entryway to all of the send data environment, which can be again based on LTO uh, archiving, or can be a Sony ODA, or can be the cloud. All of that is immediately made available to the environment. Everything starts by the user basically um, creating or selecting a project. Let me see that it is. So when the user uses the interface to select or create a project, basically there is a command being sent to the MXF server. That command basically provides information such as the project number, editor type, and other type of information. The MXF server at that point, by means of an API command, accesses the storage and either creates or selects the structures where that project resides. Okay? Once this is done, the uh, MXS server will pass on the information back to the workstation. Okay? And essentially that location, the coordinates of that space are used then by the edit workstation to establish its own connection to that particular space. Again, we are talking about the virtual space that is used to contain the materials. So at this point, the user can start working in the normal and usual way. There is a volume in there mounted if you have a Mac or a map drive if you have a, a, a PC. And the editing uh, tool will absolutely have no issues working with that virtualization. It looks like a normal volume. It will be able to do all of the functions that all of these tools can do. Uh, in the background, in the background, MXS server is basically synchronizing everything. Please notice that there is absolutely no bottleneck because the MXF server is not in the middle of what is happening. Once the connection is established, the MXF server is simply in the background. The connection is direct between the editing workstation 
and the materials in the central storage system. Once you have a number of users working with the same materials, it's going to be necessary to create locks. In other words, in Avid, for example, you have bins. And when you lock a bin, you're basically making that bin read-write access to you, but it's going to become only read-only for the rest of the users. Okay? This means that multiple users can essentially collaborate uh, at the same time uh, and basically see what each other is doing, but without really getting in the way. This read-write access uh, logs can be chained from user to user in a very dynamic way. We support this function not only in the Avid way, but we also provide this capability to tools that are not really designed to do this. Like, for example, Premiere Pro, Adobe Premiere Pro was not designed with this in mind. But we enhance the function that can be uh, used in, in Adobe and other tools that do not have this function natively, but MXS Server creates a, an environment where bin logs can happen, or the equivalent of bin, bin logs can happen for tools that do not support this. So as you work with projects then uh, using exactly the same interface, the user can decide to archive or backup a project. But what is the difference? Well, in, when you're backing up a project, you're simply sending the contents of that project at this particular time to uh, LTO, ODA, or the cloud. But you are still not eliminating the materials from the central storage. In the archive operation, you're basically doing the same thing, but at the end of the operation, you are going to essentially clean the storage, and you are essentially offloading the material. If you need it again, you just reverse that operation. So when that archive and backup project command is issued by using the new interface, what is going to happen is the MXS server will issue a series of uh, send data workflow API commands to archive the material. The send data server at that point in the background is going to establish a connection to the central storage where that material is. And it's going to start pulling the content into whatever means is available to send data to, to archive the material. Again, LTO, ODA, cloud. As that operation is in progress, okay, the send data ser server is going to be sending, essentially, by the API communication, you're going to be getting status commands. Those status, statuses are going to be used to update the database in the MXS server. And that information becomes available to the user. So now there is a, a certainty of what is happening with the archive. If something goes wrong, and every now and then you have things that go wrong. For example, a file that you're trying to archive has a, an illegal name. It has a funny character that some user decided to name that file using that funny character. So that illegal character cannot be archived. So you're going to get a specific message that, that says that you have an issue with file so and so and so. So the editor at that point can go and name the file in a, in a legal way and retry the operation at that point, the, the, the archive operation will work uh, successfully. So this is the way that it works. Uh, the system is designed to be really very efficient in the way that, uh, that it works. It doesn't require additional work in the part of the editor or media manager or producer. It is done in a very easy way and it is simplified. It's, it's a lot more simple than the, the, the way of trying to uh, do this in a manual way. Everything is automated in MXS Server. So the uh, next version of MXS, the version actually that has the integration is MXS Server version 5.2. And just to summarize a little bit what we have been covering so far, uh, the MXS Server allows you to really choose and mix between a variety of different editing systems. You can use Avid Media Composer, Adobe Premiere Pro, Final Cut Pro 7, or 10, uh, Grass Valley Ideas, DaVinci Resolve, and, and many other editing systems in the market right now. It is very easy to configure new tools. It also integrates with all your tools, not only video editing systems. Uh, systems like Pro Tools, Audition, Prelude, all those are supported. We have a, a very nice way of doing project and media sharing within Teams simultaneously, directly from whatever storage environment you have chosen to use. We do this via virtualization. That is a safe way to maintain your, your, your materials safe and avoid any type of corruption that is possible in other types of environments. We have an advanced project in bin locking. 
in some cases you can emulate a Navi system, so you can use something that is even better than that. We provide the same type of function, but to, uh, for tools that do not support bin locking, but basically provide equivalent function for them. We can use the MXF server to mix or reuse or migrate from existing or, or future tools. So the, the editing platforms on the Macs or PC can be configured, and this obviously is an insurance, is future-proofing your infrastructure in such a way that you don't need to waste money uh, by changing infrastructure every time that you change any of these elements, including the storage, including tools, and anything else that can be replaced within this environment. And this is basically the end of my section of this presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Luis. Actual story of the CEO and one of the Zendata founders. And what I want to do is just to give a quick overview of what we do and our products. As most of you know, we specialize in data storage systems for media and entertainment applications. So what we're best known for are LTO and optical archive systems. All of them run Windows operating systems, and they fundamentally have got two interfaces, a file folder interface and an API-driven data mover interface. With the file folder interface, you create the folder structure that makes sense for your application, or if the application is, say, a man, it will create its own folder structure. This means that any application that can write to and read from a disk-based Windows server will work with a Zendata archive. You can set policies to map different folders to different groups of optical or LTO cartridges. You can set the system to replicate LTO cartridges automatically. And in addition, we've got lots of other functionality tailored to the needs of creative video. All of our systems have a disk cache, which is used intelligently by the Zendata software to maximize performance in a multi-threaded environment. Turning now to the API-driven data mover interface, it uses a module of software called the Zendata Workflow API, which obtains XML instructions from an application, such as version 5.2 of MXF server, and it grabs files or groups of files from another location, such as your shared edit storage, and moves them to the archive. Similarly, it will push files from the archive back to edit storage or another storage location. This approach means that the data path is very efficient. This is tying in with what Luis was saying. Um, it's directly between the shared disk storage and the archive without going through another computer. The use of the API-driven data mover interface also has a number of other advantages, and that in those include restoring files in tape order or optical disk platter order, the interface is also often used to manage externalized cartridges, identifying to the application what cartridges are needed to restore requested offline files. So we've been doing this for quite a while. We've got over a, a thousand installations around the world. And we just recently produced this uh, spiffy looking um, global map. All of the points are real installations. And actually, when I first saw the map, I noticed something up here which is between Iceland and Scotland, and then realized it was real. We've got a system on the Faroe Islands, which is essentially a rock in the middle of the ocean. Uh, worldwide, we do offer on-site installation, but our products are actually pretty easy to install, and often remote support for the installation is all that's required. This uh, installation here is a very recent one. It's in the middle of the Indian Ocean, and it's actually in Mauritius. And in this case, we provided uh, on-site installation and training just a few weeks ago. And I, I know that this installation was really easy because our support engineer came back with a tan. In terms of connectivity, we've got really good connectivity. Um, it's because of the two interface options, and we've been doing this for a, a really long time. So uh, we connect with a, a very wide range of media asset management systems and other applications that are commonly used in creative video. Um, and, of course, we're really pleased now that Film Partners is creating a, a tighter integration with us using the Workflow API for MXF server. And uh, just a final slide. I just want to talk about what we're going to be showing at NAB. It's uh, a couple of major things. Uh, we're going to be showing an all-in-one storage system that combines high-performance shared disk storage and archive on one server. The shared disk storage is suitable for 4K workflows and beyond, and provides 
just over 100 terabytes of usable capacity at the bottom end to over 300 terabytes. The archive options are LTO, Sony Optical, and Azure Cloud. And by combining shared disk storage and the archive on one server, it simplifies the storage infrastructure. And it means that you really don't have to be concerned about network connections between shared disk and archive storage because there are no network connections. We'll also be demonstrating a new interface to Azure Blob Storage uh, with the same interface options as our on-premise LTO and optical systems, i.e. standard file folder and the API-driven data mover interface. And uh, in fact, the addition of Blob Storage will be an add-on option for all of our existing customers um, who will be able to combine their existing on-premise LTO or optical with Azure Cloud Storage. So with that said, I'm going to pass back to Elisa, who's been monitoring the questions. What do we have, Elisa? Thank you, Phil. Let's see. The virtual instances MXF server works with are actual copies of the files? Okay, great question. Actually, no. They are not copies of the file. The file in an MXF server environment exists only once. Then what we actually do is create a hard link, which can be perceived as a, as a clone of the index entry and the metadata controller of the storage environment that makes creates essentially an alternate data path to the sectors in the disk that contain the materials. So all we are doing is cloning that index entry, therefore, the, the space is not, uh, is not compromised. We are not really using double space if we want to use the, the material from two different editors. So if you have five, ten, that could be a problem because you will end up with a lot of data that is just a, a, a waste. It's a duplicates of the same material, but we don't. The file only exists one time, and then for every user that is using that material, there is going to be a link, a hard link that is a very small object that points to the original sectors of the file. Awesome. Um, so another question came in, and I believe it's an extension to the previous one I just asked. So um, it says, does that duplicate the space needed? No, it's exactly what we are trying to avoid. We don't, we don't duplicate the space. The space, the, the file will only use the space necessary for that file to be there once. And then for every user that we have, there will be an extra path, an, an extra hard link that will point to the same file, but using a different path. So we achieve essentially the objective of having multiple files, but without really having multiple files. The users will feel like they have their own file. In reality, it's the same shared file, but they have a unique way to get to that file in the storage. OK, thank you. And then is MXF server ready to work with 4K material? Great question. Well, MXF server is ready to work with 8K materials. Uh, all you need to get concerned about is that the storage that you are using is actually certified to work with 4K. And obviously, the workstations that you're using also need to be capable of working with 4K materials. What the MXS server does is not impacted by the resolution of the materials. Your network, your storage, and your workstations need to be capable of working for 4K. MXS server works with that, and there is absolutely no issue with working 4K from the point of view of MXS server. We are basically dealing with the files. Uh, with very small data transactions against the, against the storage. We are not really handling the heavy duty load that the storage and the workstations have to, have to do in order to process 4K. Great. Um, how do you ingest with MXF server? Great question too. Essentially, MXF server preserves all of the ways in which uh, you can ingest with your workstation. Essentially, anything that you can do with an Avid system or a Premiere system or a, any other system, you will be able to use exactly the same procedure. You are basically ingesting to a volume that you have mounted, and that ingest is going to look perfectly normal. MXF Server also provides ways to do central ingest, which means that somebody who is responsible for ingest will be able to centrally bring the materials into the projects even before the editors have a chance to do it. So the, the, the interface, the user interface that is used for anything else, 
allows for uh, material ingest in a variety of forms and for a, from a variety of sources in a, in a central way. So anything that is supported by your tool is still supported by MXS Server plus the ability to do central ingest by using the user interface of MXS Server. Alrighty, thank you. Um, so here's another one. When a project is archived, is there a way now for the media to not be archived in the project since we usually archive the raw media before a project starts? We do not want to have multiple copies of the media. Yes, I, we need to go to the concept of archival and backup. If you're doing a backup for, let's say, you want to have a current state of the project before you do additional changes. It's basically a state in time. Uh, a backup operation will actually produce two versions of the media. You're going to have the, the media in the production storage as well as in whatever archival storage you are using. So in that circumstance, when you want a backup, by definition, you have, a du you have two versions of that same media. When you do an archive, as soon as the completion message comes back from the send data server, then the original media that resides in the production storage is removed. So at that point, you only have one version, and it only exists in the archive at that point. Now, if you want to bring it back, then by using the same interface, the MXS server is aware that that, that particular project is archived, and it will request, uh, basically in a parallel way as, as archiving, it will request from the send data server to have that project restored back to the production media. And at that point, the project will be in the production storage as well as the place where it resides in the archive. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question I think might be a question for Phil. So it says, am I right by saying that Zen Data is essentially an LTO-based archive system? Who are your competitors in this segment? Thanks, Louisa. Actually, I think it's probably a question for both of us, Louise. So, of our thousand or so installations worldwide, it's true that most of them are on-premise LTO today. A couple of years ago, we added support for Sony Optical Disk Archive um, libraries, and we're seeing an increasing number of Sony um, ODA installations now as well. And as I mentioned, uh, NAB, will be launching our support for, um, initially, the Microsoft Azure Cloud. So that will kind of take us into an, um, an, another archive type. But perhaps the best, the question was also asking about who are our competitors. Well, I, I think it might be best to answer that in the context of MXF Server. So, so what other archive types do um, does Film Partners support with MXF Server, Luis? Uh, thank you, Phil. Well, Essentially, there are other archive environments that are in a potentially a different type of archival uh, providers. For example, there's the IBM uh, Tibble Disk Storage Manager, TSM. There is a very strong integration with, uh, with IBM Tibble Disk Storage Manager. Uh, the, the, the difference, though, is uh, Tibble Disk Storage Manager is a very, very heavy-duty system, typically uh, used by very large corporations. So we wanted to have something with Send Data that is a little more accessible to smaller post producers or even television companies that don't necessarily have a, a huge enterprise archival environment such as IBM TSM. So Send Data is is a it's an archival environment that is more better suited for uh, media. Okay, while well, Tibble Storage Manager is a generic. Uh, environment that you can use for anything. You can use it in a bank to store transactions or whatever. Uh, Send data is more of a uh, is more of a um, uh, media archival environment. Of course, you can use it for other things, but it's optimized for media. And this is what why we were looking at the Send data integration uh, with a lot of interest. There is also the ability to put the uh, to store materials, archive materials from MXF server to data mover environments where you may have a, a cache where you basically uh, simply copy the materials and, and then the, the, uh, the environment moves elsewhere. The problem with that approach, and it's essentially what we were using before with Zendata, is that you have very little 
conversation between the send data and the MXF server server. The data, the status of, it, of the operation, the status of individual elements within that project is not really there. So the ability to locate or to uh, ascertain where, when there is a, an, an issue is a little more difficult to do because all you're doing is essentially moving data from one disk to another. And, and that uh, is, is not necessarily a very efficient way of doing it. So even though MXF server supports other environments, we prefer the, uh, the send data approach because first of all, it's media centric. And number two is more in line with the types of needs that a media company may use. Uh, send data can be also be used with uh, a MAM system. And by the way, MXS server also has integrations with MAM systems, the same way as Sendata has uh, interfaces with, uh, with MAM systems, which means that you can have a complete environment that is using the same elements in a, in a more or less collaborative way w with a lot of uh, assurance that your, your infrastructure is not going to go out of, uh, out of use because you have changed something in the environment. We have very good integrations with MAM systems and other types of systems that are also per peripheric to this type of operation. Uh, good, good, great, thanks. Um, rather than hand back to Elisa, I'll just, uh, for efficiency, just read the next question. Put you on the spot. When will 5.2 be available, Luis? 5.2 is available now for a limited number of customers. We're really uh, moving it uh, uh, to, to customers that needed it uh, immediately. And then it's going to be generally available at, at NAP time. Great, thanks, Luis. Um, so here's another question. Let's suppose I'm revisiting an old MXF server project that includes some material that has been already sent to LTO by Zendata. Okay. Would Zendata automatically bring it back? Zendata will bring it back as soon as the user or the media manager or whatever determines there is a need to bring that material back. It's going, not going to be automatic. It, it will be automatic, but it's, it's triggered by the action of a user. If the project that is in the database, obviously in the MSF server database, uh, is accessed by a user and tries to connect to it, obviously that activity, the action of that user accessing that project will trigger a command that is a restore command that will go to the send data server and the send data server at that point will restore the materials onto storage. But it's really triggered by the user trying to use that project again. Thank you. So next one is, in a support situation, who do you call when it's unclear or whether it's a Zendata issue or an MXF server issue? Actually, you can call either of the two companies and we are going to get it resolved. But essentially, when, when it's an issue that you are accessing from an MXF server, you are discovering there is an issue. You will normally contact MXF server support first. And if we determine that the issue is with, uh, with send data, we are going to obviously contact uh, send, data, send data support to, to get that piece resolved. But from a point of view of the user, the function is available from the MX server user interface, so therefore it automatically becomes an issue that we need to address. Good to know. Thank you. So what is the user limitation of single MXF server? What about licensing model used in MXF server? The MXF server is licensed uh, by concurrent seats. In other words, uh, you are free to install MXF server client in any number of machines. You can install it in all the machines in the site. You don't pay for that installation. What you pay for is the number of active users that are, can be concurrently using the system at any one point in time. So uh, it starts with five, that's the minimum, uh, and it grows to any number beyond that. It, we decided that five was the, the logical number of users for a small installation, and it's about uh, the minimum that you're going to have in order to make that investment uh, viable. So if you have two users, three users, you can still do it, I guess, in a manual way. Uh, the truth of the matter is even with two or three users, MXS server is still a, a viable system for you. But the cost that is associated with the infrastructure needed to run MXS server may not make it viable in that sense. Great. Thanks, Luis. 
So here's another question, and it looks like it's two parts. Um, so when an editor is using MXF server, can other editors in the same team access the same folder and project? And will the project need to be renamed so each editor can have read-write access? Actually, no. The, it, it's going to look to every user as if they are using the same folder. In reality, what is happening is they are using a folder that is in their own virtual space. And obviously the name of that folder will be the same for all users. Physically speaking, every folder will be different because all of them are working from their own sandbox, their own virtual space. But the server is in the background synchronizing everything. So MX server is like the traffic cop that is ensuring that users don't step on each other's toes. The the users feel like they are sharing the same folder. Uh, the effect is going to be the same. It's like they were using the same folder, but in reality, each one of the users has a different folder, named the same, and MX server is synchronizing it with the master. Thanks, Luis. So we have one more question. So are there other industries slash environments using MXF servers and data? For example, broadcasters, education, banking, government? Absolutely. We have MXF server systems in a couple of major banks in the U.S. and maybe some of those users are right now uh, on this call. <laughs> I know. And we have post houses, we have uh, movie studios, we have uh, lots of broadcasters and many other companies that use MX server for corporate communications or corporate marketing uses. It's also used in several large universities that are using it to teach editors to edit. In fact, we just have a, a modified version of MX server. You can configure it to work for a university in such a way that a teacher, for example, can have uh, different lessons in the system that the, the teacher has the ability to share with the students. Uh, all the students can see what the teacher is posting and they, they can see their own materials but they cannot see what all the other students are doing. So this is a, a version of MX server configuration that is used specifically for teaching and is very effective in that sense. We also have some MX server systems in uni universities that are producing media independently from that just for either web distribution or internal broadcast within the university. Great. Thank you so much, Luis. Well, that concludes our questions. But of course, if any others come to mind, feel free to reach out to us. You can send your inquiries at zendata at zendata.com. Um, and just as a reminder, this session is being recorded and we will follow up with you once it becomes available on our website. So thank you again for joining us today. Thanks, Luis, and thank you, Phil.